welcome to the third part of this uh, series of smart talks and uh, this topic uh, is actually been presented by an authority figure in the management of hydrus hernias the topic of hydrus hernias is extensive and even a whole day uh, will not actually cover every aspect of hydrus hernia it's a learn long learning process which we'll understand after you listen to the talk from dr roy and uh, the moderators for today's session are dr pramod shinde and dr rahul mahadar and dr roy's introduction will be done by dr hv shriram from bangalore over to you dr shriram uh, good evening everybody maybe good afternoon or good morning if people are watching from other parts of the world it's an excellent session organized by awr surgeons community where we are dealing extensively with <clears throat> the one subject that is hiatus hernia and its anatomy and management and to speak about this we have a very eminent surgeon dr rai patankan from mumbai who has worked extensively he has original articles research papers and he has demonstrated this surgery n number of times to all audiences international national and also local and this is one surgery which is mainly symptoms driven and if you do a good surgery the patient will benefit for lifelong and if you choose a wrong patient and even if you do the right surgery he will curse you for lifelong so it's very important to know the indications contraindications what will give the best results and i am sure dr roy patankar will deliver an excellent talk on this with all his accumulated experience experience coming from him thank you everybody and please uh, be sure to ask questions at the end of the session over to dr roy patankar roy you are muted Roy, you are muted. Muted. Can you hear me, sir? Is my are yes. my slides are the audio and video both clear to you? Yes. 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 Great. Thank you, Dr. Shyam, for the kind words. It is exactly twenty-five years that I have been doing hiatus hernia surgery. and uh, you you mentioned that i'm going to speak to you from experience but i'm going to speak to you about learnings that i've had along this sometimes rocky path of the last 25 years of doing this surgery for grd uh thank you awr surgeons community for inviting me here today on a topic that is close to my heart this talk will run through indications a lot of finer technical details because a lot of stuff that i'm going to speak together uh, today is published and unpublished i will tell you my own mistakes my own experiences the troubleshooting i've had the causes of failure that you may expect something about shortened esophagus short gastric division crural closure use of mesh redo surgery refractory gird and what's new just to give you a brief overlay this is how the crura of the diaphragm are placed and it's important to understand the anatomy in order to deliver consistently good results as one of my fellows told me a knowledge of anatomy is only a dead weight if you don't know how to apply that knowledge with the necessary skill the first thing we need to understand is the concept of the phreno esophageal ligament which allows independent movement of the esophagus and diaphragm the second is the transparent coosters window and this is important for two reasons even in the most obese person you will find that the gastrohepatic omentum has the coosters window which is relatively transparent the two things that we are concerned about when you go there are the hepatic branch of the vagus and sometimes an anomalous left hepatic artery that comes off the celiac artery i have seen it about four times in my career what we do in this situation is if you see a large vessel crossing the coosters window we put a clip on that and observe the left lobe of the liver for congestion 
At the end of five minutes, if it's congested, we take off the clip and keep it in place. The second thing here is to remember to keep the hepatic branch of the vagus intact, because otherwise you will have a proportion of your patients getting gallstones postoperatively. The third tip I would give you is never remove the peritoneum that covers the right crust. This is important because many times in large defects, in paraesophageal hernias, when you're closing a defect, the whole right crust will split. Sometimes you may deliberately split the right crust, but I will talk about this a little later in my lecture. What are, what are the structures of interest around the esophagus? The, the left vagus is the anterior vagus, which is closely applied to the esophagus. Should not bother you in routine hiatus hernia surgery, but in a achalasia, important to see it. In a recurrent hiatus hernia surgery, and we have now done more than 50 recurrent hernias, the vagus is often enveloped in the fibrosis around the esophagus and important to preserve it. In a routine fundal application, look at the right of the posterior vagus, and this is extremely important. The orientation of the crura is also different. The right cruise is typically straight, while the left cruise is oblique. So when you're taking sutures of the crura, my advice to you is take a larger bite of the left cruise and a relatively smaller bite of the right cruise. This is the picture that you would see the, the right cruise covered with the peritoneum or the phrenological ligament, the posterior vagus seen, and this is the beginning of dissection. See, these patients are unusual. Patients in India or anywhere in the world are usually willing to take long-term PPIs, except we are now concerned about the, the side effects of long-term PPI usage. So a small proportion of patients will come to your outpatient clinic with typically a lot of research done on the net, looking at renal, dementia, lung issues, bone issues, but that's very small. Very few people get side effects of PPIs, but what is important is patients who are volume refluxes. Those with complicated GERD, like hematemesis, strictures, aspiration pneumonias, and complications due to large hiatus hernias. The third group of patients is somebody I want you to caution, caution you about. Please be careful on operating on patients with atypical symptoms. What do I mean by that? Those patients presenting with retrosternal chest pain, laryngitis, jaw pain, hand pain, I will come on to this, I think, maybe outside the scope of this lecture, but this is one of the areas of interest I have, is looking at patients of so-called so atypical GERD. Hiatus hernias, everyone knows, but there, remember, every hiatus hernia is not a candidate for surgery because you may have a large hiatus hernia and minimal reflux and only a lax G junction like this with a prolapsing part of stomach and severe reflux. So size of hiatus hernia should not be a criteria. This is what a good anti-reflux wall will look like. Let's look at patients who don't do well after anti-reflux surgery. So this is a paper published in the ANZ Journal of Surgery in 2002. This is one of my earliest recurrent hiatus hernias. I think I did this in the year 2012. So generally male patients, those who are PPI responsive, those who have normal body motility, and those who are volume refluxes will do the best. Be careful of those with atypical symptoms. So generally, if you ask me, the patients that you will get are those who have either heartburn or those who have volume reflux. In the early part of your career, please choose patients with volume reflux who are PPI responsive and have no atypical symptoms, and you generally can't go wrong in this situation. If you have a patient who comes only with heartburn or is not PPI responsive, your red flag should be up. This patient needs impedance monometry, a 24-hour pH, and careful workup before some symptom. I'm not going to go into too much of a refractory symptom, but remember there is refractory symptoms and there is refractory GERD. These are two different things. I'd like the audience to read this paper in gut in the Asia-Pacific consensus on refractory GERD before making up your mind how to treat them. 25 years of doing hiatus and ear surgeries, you've done just over a thousand surgeries so far. I think the early part by the year 2000, I, th I thought I knew it all. 
in our center in those days we were doing only nissan's fundal application and we thought we had mastered that operation quote unquote and then we started getting some patients with gas bloat some who developed dysphagia and then you think oh man i'm never going to understand this operation and over the years burning my fingers getting a few gray hair we have realized that the the common problem i see in many surgeons is that we tend to learn one operation well and we do that operation for all patients who come to us the same thing about rectal prolapse people learn posterior sutured rectopexy we will offer the same operation to every patient with full thickness prolapse similarly the dunning kruger effect should always come to your mind tailor the operation based on the patient the patient symptoms the underlying pathology and the lifestyle changes that you expect how do i typically evaluate my patients the first thing is are they volume refluxes or are they hard burn that is acid refluxes i will insist that an endoscopy is done in my center if necessary with a esophageal biopsy remember early motility disorders and even achalasia can sometimes present only with hard burn and no dysphagia we have a fairly busy motility lab doing upper gi lower gi manometries impedance phs and 24 hour ph monitoring we also will selectively do a gastric emptying study so if a patient has a symptom of gas bloat or upper abdominal distension i will never do a fundoplication till i do a gastric emptying study both for solids and liquids the endo flip is a new technology currently not available in india but i'm sure to check the intraop distensibility of esophagus you can often change your mind about what kind of wrap you're doing based on the results of your endo flip i often get asked by young surgeons from the periphery of the country saying doc is it mandatory to do a manometry and do i always need to do a 24 hour ph so as far as the ph study is concerned you do a ph study only when the diagnosis of gerd is in doubt if you are convinced the diagnosis is gerd do only a impedance manometry it to me it is mandatory literature says it is a optional investigation the sages also mentions it to be a optional investigation but having learned my lessons and burning my fingers over the time i will never do anti reflux surgery unless there is a manometry ideally impedance but at least a monometry remember there may be a concept of a alkaline reflux it may not necessarily be a acid reflux and this is what i mentioned to you about refractory gerd versus refractory symptoms there are two different words think about it a little bit before you dismiss that three men are a problem i call it these are three people that i think for the youngsters in the audience not the promote chindes and the shivarams of the world but for the young pgs who are watching this please learn the history of the disease please read about what these precursors did for you look at the belsi mark 4 operation look at the trans thoracic surgery the trans abdominal surgery and there is a lot of learning in this and i think you will be a better mature surgeon as a result of reading surgical history so i call it three men and a problem the problem is gerd and these are three great surgeons rudolf nissen Lucius Hill and Ralf I. Not going to go in history too much. Another lovely paper from Marco Patti, which you must read: an analysis of operations for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Rudolf Nissen was a Turkish surgeon who migrated to the United States in 1939 and gave us the famous Nissen or the Nissen Rossetti fundoplication. This is how our patients are placed: leg split. i am standing between the patient's legs the monitor about the left hand of the patient and these are how my ports are placed there is if you see a nathanson retractor placed in the epigastrium i will usually take my viewing port 2/3 1/3 between the umbilicus and the zippy sternum and i strongly recommend this for every of my this is the um, a short master video so showing this is the manometry this is the working setup always a nathanson retractor left left leg of the patient this is how my ot is basically placed for the patient in a, a split position this is how my ports are never ever keep the ports uh, viewing port of the umbilicus you will always struggle so whether you are doing a achalasia esophageal diverticulectomy or a trans hiatal esophagectomy 
please always keep your viewing port two third, one third between the zitti sternum and lumbalicus. These are, I have a working port on the left midclavicular line and the right midclavicular line. And this is how the, the nascent center. It's nice to put a small needle in to confirm that this is in line with the inferior border of the liver. Because if you have a big floppy left lobe of the liver, you may have some difficulty in doing this. I've tried to have graspers going in holding the cruise. I've tried to, to have a C retractor. I've used the, the fan retractors, but finally I am convinced that it is a Nathanson which is exposes the cruise the best. Minute you put in the Nathansons, you immediately are able to see the Cooster's window. The Cooster's window is just below the caudate lobe of the liver. Retract the stomach down and lateral and start your dissection at the inferior border of the caudate lobe. I tend to put my left side working port through the falciform ligament because this anchors it. Preserve the hepatic branch of the vagus and look for any anomalous left hepatic artery that could be coming off the celiac. You may use any energy source you like, but this is where you will begin. You follow the caudate lobe of the liver till you find the right cruise. And that is the first view of the right cruise. The minute I see the right cruise, I make an incision on the peritoneum lateral to the right cruise, making sure I keep the peritoneum intact. So remove the perit peritoneum or the phenocytial ligament, but never on top of the crura. This is an extremely simple but important point that you must remember. As you go down, you will start lo looking for the left cruise of the, of the diaphragm from behind the esophagus, and then take down the phrenocerebral ligament to expose the left cruise. In our hospital, we divide every operation in 10 steps, and this is step four. Whether I do a fundoplication or a hepatectomy, I divide the operation in 10 steps, and unless there is something compelling in the anatomy or the pathology of the disease, the same 10 steps in the same succession are followed. This is the exposure of the left cruise. Minute I divide the free nervous ligament, the left cruise is seen, and I'm now creating a window between the left cruise and the esophagus. Remember, if you don't do this, if you thrust your instrument from behind the right crust, you may get an injury of the posterior wall of the esophagus. So this is the kind of window that I want to make. You must, this is an important cause of dysphagia, the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the mediastinal dissection. I would invite you to read a, a monogram by a surgeon called Olschlager from the US. He divides this mediastinal dissection in type 1 and type 2. What you've seen so far is a type 1 dissection. The dissection in the posterior mediastinum, like you see me doing, is the Olschlager type 2 dissection. This is something I've been doing only for the last five or six years, but I am convinced that one of the important causes of failure of fundoplication or recurrence of fundoplication is inadequate esophageal length. I have done this also in some cadaveric work uh, in KEM hospital, and I have realized that the, the wrap is not so important, the crude closure is not so important, as is the mediastinal dissection to lengthen the esophagus. And I will actually putting a measuring tape to make sure that when I'm pulling the OG junction down, I have five centimeters of esophagus in the abdomen. And when I let the traction go, at least three centimeters must remain in the abdomen. Should we divide the short gastrics? I am going to discuss this in the latter part of my lecture. We do divide the short gastrics. We start on the upper part of the fundus and divide the short gastrics when I'm doing a Nissen or a two-phase, but I'll, I'll show you and discuss the literature about this. Does this cause gas bloat? The jury is still out on this. We are closely looking at our patients, including telephonic surveys on them every three months till three years are complete. And I'll show you some of the data that we have got with time. Important that you take the last short gastrics carefully. These tend to, to bleed and go retracted into the hilum of the spleen. But this is the part of the fundus that is going to go to the opposite side. So this is extremely important that you do this and mobilize the stomach well to get a shoe shine maneuver. You see the divided short gastrics have come on this side of the esophagus and I'm doing a very easy shoe shine maneuver. Another technical tip here is let the stomach go and see if it gets pulled back towards the left side. If it's getting pulled back, there is something holding the stomach and you need to free the, the fundus more. 
See how the peritoneum is kept intact. I use 2-0 ethy bond, but you may use any synthetic. I prefer to use a multi-filament suture material, easy to knot. I used to initially use polypropylene, but I've completely switched over to using 2-0 ethy bond at this time. How much is enough? I think early part of my career, I think I was overzealous in closing the crura, and that is why I was getting dysphagia and four to five percent of my. And this is the technique that we have, we are doing, and we have published. I'll show you the publication on this of how to actually quantitate the crural closure. You may then do either a Nissen's or a two pays, and I'm going to cut part of this video and go to the next one. This is a paper in J last and showed that both Nissen's as well as two pays are extremely effective in controlling acid reflux, but the functional side effects appear more often in the Nissen's fundal application group. If you ask me this question in 2000, 100% of my operations were Nissen's. In the year 2021, 70% are two pays, 25% are Nissen's and 5% are doors. I will talk about this as I go on. I'll keep this short because I think we have 30 minutes to finish this talk. But some of the technical tips I wish to emphasize is the size of the retroistal window. Should we divide the short gastrics? Should we quantitate the crural closure? Quantitate the esophageal length and redo surgery? This is a point that I make. Keep the, the peritoneum on the cruise intact. Look at the posterior vagus and loop the OG junction. You may use a Penrose drain, you may use an umbilical tape, a Foley catheter, anything you wish. Remember when this is one of my older videos, you can see a 10 millimeter harmonic in use, just to make a point that you will always divide the bare area of the stomach. It's not only the short gastrics, but there are often loose areolar tissues holding the stomach down to the pancreas. And this is extremely important that we do this. Let's look at some of the literature. This is some of the data which actually show you the, the common concern that I have and many surgeons have is does division of short gastrics cause gas bloat? Look at this paper by Watson from Australia. 102 patients followed up over 20 years in two groups. Very interesting. Meta-analysis showed equivalent reflux control, equal dysphagia rates, but marginally higher bloating after the vessels are divided. Point to keep in mind. The second thing I want to tell you is when you're dividing the short gastrics, please protect the greater curve. This is a patient coming to us from a teaching hospital in South Mumbai. And the patient came with a perforative peritonitis on day six after a fund application, having been discharged on day three. Extensive perforative peritonitis. In a minute, you will see the reason. You can see the amount of contamination. And what this patient had was a thermal burn of the wrap that was pulled through. So the surgeon had gone too close to the greater curve when he was dividing. Remember, this is not a sleeve gastrectomy. Extremely important that you leave a small amount of tissue on the stomach. If you leave too much tissue, then you will get clogging. You can see the, the nice punched out perforation with no pouting of mucosa, indicating that this is clearly a thermal burn. Now, how much is enough? In the beginning part of your career, you will generally overzealously close too much of the crura. No question that you must close the crew, but how much? In the early part of my career, I was actually using a Fogarty's, sorry, I beg your pardon, dilators. Till I think in the last year before I left Southampton where I trained, I saw an anesthetist put a, a bougie through the esophagus into the peritoneum. And that is the last time I've used a, a bougie in my life. So there is a known risk of esophageal injury using. So I, I did this in Ethicon Center using pigs. And I found that putting a 56 French bougie in the esophagus is equivalent to putting a eight French Fogarty's catheter. And you should leave enough space between the esophagus and the last suture, and this will allow the food bolus to go down. So I believe in quantifying everything. I don't like people saying in my experience, this is right. I think whether it's length of esophagus, where you put in a tape and measure it, or your cruel distance, it's extremely important you quantitate this. We published our data of 109 patients in two groups each and published this in JMAS last year, showing that our rate of dysphagia using quantitative assessment of this technique was less than 1%. Why did we go off the Nissen's? So these are some of the problems that you can get after Nissen's, and I have seen almost every type of rap migration and recurrence 
and we have now done more than 50 recurrent hiatal hernia surgeries. I'll try and show you some of the ones. I'm not going to go too much of this, but I'm just going to mention, mention that it is important that you quantitate everything and have a standardized step of working. When to do an anterior fundoplication? If you had asked me this question two years ago, I would have said I never do an anterior fundoplication for reflux. I now think the jury is open. I have had communication with several surgeons in Australia and New Zealand who do a fair amount of door fundoplications, but I will come on to this a little bit later in my talk, depending on how much time we have and uh, whether Rahul allows me to complete this. I have been doing the door extensively only for uh, prevention along with a, a myotomy like you can see in this. The question is efficacy versus dysphagia. And this is very, very important. There is a lot of data come out now on anterior fundoplications, and you can see that the Nissen has a statistically better result in heartburn or in the need for a PPI usage as compared to an anterior 180 degree fundoplication. This is a paper that looks at pH and the resting pressure, again showing that the, the Nissen has a superior data as compared to the anterior fundoplication. Should we tailor the wrap based on body motility? I think data is divided on this, but if you ask me personally, I am convinced that anybody with an ineffective esophageal motility, what is this ineffective? I would strongly recommend the young surgeon should spend time in a motility lab for a week or two before starting fundoplication. You need to understand rapid swallows. You need to understand liquid swallows. You need to understand IRP before you make up, and to me, an ineffective swallow is definitely an indication for a partial fundoplication. Unquestionably, data show that the two pays partial 270 degrees has lesser dysphagia and no difference in heartburn control, and this is level one evidence. Clear evidence to say that the optimal length of the wrap should be between 2.5 and 3 centimeters which produces better data compared to a short two pays. How do I make up my mind in our own hospital? Any elderly patient, anybody who has any abnormality of body motility or any abnormal esophageal length, and this is about 75% of my patients will get a two pays. Do I do listens? Yes. Young fit patient, volume reflux, PPI dependent, no dysphagia, normal body motility with low LES pressures. These are the only patients I do a nissens. To me, it's a trade-off. I don't know if you agree, but to me, the best reflux control, the long-term durability is with the nissens, but the side effects are going to be more. The dysphagia is going to be more. I've actually cut out the anterior 90 because I don't consider that. To me, it's nissens, two pays, and an anterior 180. What does a good wall look like? We had one of our DNB students doing a thesis on GERD, and we called our patients back for a, a free endoscopy at six months to actually quantitate and grade our wraps. And this is how we graded our wraps. And this is based on a paper in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. And I can tell you that the kind of the, the type of surgery I'm doing today is very different from what I did five years ago, which is very different from what I did 15 years ago. So this is a process of evolution. As I think Ramana commented on one of his posts, this problem has many solutions and every solution seems to have a problem. So let's look at this a little bit carefully. And I have failed repeatedly. And some of the learnings I'm telling you is from the gray hair I developed in looking after these patients. So remember a patient after a gastrectomy or esophagectomy is okay with getting some reflux, with getting some bile gastritis because he doesn't want recurrence. He wants to live. But if your fundoplication gets a dysphagia or a gas bloat, or he needs to take PPIs, he's going to curse you. And more importantly, he's going to visit every gastroenterologist in your city, and you'll never get a reference again in your life from that group. So I'm going to keep some of the technical problems that I have seen are problems of slip wrap, where the wrap migrates into the chest. And there is type 1, type 2, type 3. There is a twisted wrap. There is a tight wrap where you suture it too closely without adequate mobilization, and some of these concepts I'm going to discuss in the next 10 minutes. This is my own patient. I think it was the fifth patient I did in my career in the year of 1996. 
This was a 50-year-old man who on day two developed retching, got severe chest pain, continuous vomiting, had a tachycardia. I did a CT that showed a rap migration. I did his endoscopy that showed that the rap had migrated. So I keep telling my fellows, the best post-operative care is what you do in the, in the operating room. Never forget this adage. So how do you prevent a rap migration? One is lenin the esophagus well. Take one bite of the nissens through the esophagus, or every bite through the esophagus. And lastly, I will always anchor the cruise to both the crura. I used to initially uh, anchor it only to the right cruise, but I now anchor the wrap on both sides, the right and the left cruise. Some of the mistakes you'll make are too tight a wrap when you inadequately mobilize the stomach or too long a wrap. You remember in the partial fundoplication, any wrap below two centimeters and more than 3.5 centimeters is bad or in the bottom is what is called the lateral torsion deformity because you've not mobilized the fundus well, it is pulling the wrap to the other side. So this is one of my own patients where I undid the wrap, mobilized the fundus some more and brought the, this is what a good wrap should look like. This is, I think, a video from 2001. You can see I'm using Mersilk and polypropylene, which I've given up using for the last 15 years. But this is a suture line in the midline and intra-abdominal length of esophagus above the wrap. There is definitely a learning curve in this. So when you're starting in this, please call a senior surgeon in your town to assist you. The key concerns are number one, recurrence, dysphagia, gas bloating, and need for PPI usage post-op. There was a paper by Nimish Wakil's group in the American Journal of, in JAMA, which said that almost 30% of patients after a Nissen's need PPI. But this is, I think, an overstatement. We have looked at our own patients very carefully over the last 25 years. And I can tell you for sure that not around 3 to 4% of my patients take PPIs intermittently. One of the problems that you tend to get after anti-reflux surgery is dysphagia. So when you have a patient who comes with dysphagia, either in your own hands or somebody else's hands, in your outpatient clinic, you will try and assess the cause of dysphagia. Look at whether a monometry was done preoperatively. Look at whether the LES pressures were hypotensive or normotensive pre-op. Was the dysphagia immediately post-op or did it develop late? Because immediate post-op is likely to be a, uh, a technical issue or maybe edema due to the wrap. As opposed to a late, a patient says he was well for six months and then developed dysphagia. Likely this is a rap migration or something else. So the common causes of dysphagia and the commonest what I see in my practice is wrong selection of patient, inadequate esophageal length, too tight accrual closure, inadequate size of window or badly done fundal mobilization or wraps. I think the endoflip is an instrument made by Medtronic. Currently, I don't have this. I'm not sure if any group in, the, in our country has this in India, but the intraop distensibility of the esophagus could help you decide what the right wrap should be. Should we use a mesh or not? And I think the jury is still out on this. There are measures and there are anti-measures, if I may use that term loosely, in the group of uh, hyatosania surgeries. And there is a vertical divide in the group of hyatosania surgeons about the role of mesh. These are the various meshes. Let me go to the bottom one first. Never use a biological mesh. I was using a biological mesh till 2015, till uh, uh, the Schlager's group produced their own data in 2011, saying biological mesh was good. But five years down the line, when the same group looked at the same patients over five years, the rate of recurrent hernias was the same as if no mesh was used. So the porcine, the biological mesh is out. Point two, never use a polypropylene mesh on the esophagus. I used it only for, I'll, I'll come to that a bit later. This is a summary of the data. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But the factors that I would suggest that you choose in decision making is, is this a recurrent hiatus hernia where I have a higher preponderance of putting meshes? I put meshes much more in paraesophageal hernias where the size of the defect is more than five centimeters. I have a very elderly patient, which is seen in PEHs, and the cruel pillars are not good. Some of the factors that you want to, or if you do want to put a mesh, I think it's a little outside the scope of this lecture because I can do a one hour talk only on cruel closure, is the use of release incisions. When I have large paraesophageal hernias where I don't want to put a mesh, I will now do a release incision on the left side of the diaphragm or on the right cruise vertically, bring the crura together 
and then put a mesh laterally away from the esophagus. Obviously, the concern of the esophagus, of the mesh near the esophagus is, is obviously uh, uh, erosion. The second thing is, like in AWR, no bridging repairs. One of the problems that you will get with these meshes is if you only put in a mesh, this mesh tends to fold into the chest. You can see this is a uh, chlorhexidine impregnated PTFE mesh, so obviously a, a 10, 15 year old video. You make a U cut on the mesh, deploy the mesh posteriorly, but I am not closing the crura in this. And this patient after four years came back to me with the X-ray chest and a CT scan showing a small bubble of the fundus in the chest. So this is my technical mistake. The second mistake you can see me making, I am suturing the periesophageal tissue onto the mesh, a no-no in today's day and age. So the bottom line is, this is another patient who had a radiological recurrence. This is a physio mesh in my own hands. I've just deployed a physio mesh for a large paraesophageal hernia. Luckily at five year follow up, this patient didn't have a recurrence, but never do this. I will now go to the extent of closing the crura as much as is possible, and then doing a loose down, particularly in large paraesophageal hernias, and then deploying a, a composite mesh. The video on the right is sent to me by a surgeon in Goa using a, a mesh anterior to the esophagus. This is pure stupidity. You never put a mesh anterior to the esophagus. This is never going to work. Every mesh must be only put behind the esophagus. How to cut the mesh? Now, again, I don't have published data on this. Initially, you, you saw what I did. I was making a U cut and placing the mesh below the, uh, the esophagus and suturing the U onto the two crura. Now, if you look at the data on recurrent hiatus hernias, the maximum amount of recurrences occur anteriorly and to the left crust. So now I do a reverse C. The mesh is put like this. This is my right cruise. I'll put the mesh like this. So the area over the left cruise and anteriorly, there is no cut on the mesh. Again, I hasten to add, I've been doing this only for the last two years and I have no data to back what I'm saying. Just some plain cold logic. This is never, the second point I want to make is never use tacks. There has been a case in, in Mumbai where somebody put tackers on a mesh and the patient developed a, a hemopericardium post-op, had to have a thoracotomy in a pericardial window. Simple rule is always suture, never put a, a tacker. I think I have another about 10, 15 minutes. So I'll go keep going till I think Pramod puts up his right hand and I'll stop. Pramod is currently only smiling. So Pramod, when you put up your right hand, I'm going to stop. If you look at data, there is about a 20 to 30% incidence of recurrence in hiatal hernias over time. And this I'm talking, see hiatus hernias is something that a patient lives with for the rest of his life. So extremely important that your hiatus hernia should stand the test of time. And the problems are repetitive stresses from the mechanics of respiration, coughing, straining, vomiting, hiccuping, and this is based on this data. What contributes to recurrence? Crural closure. To me, the most important contributor is shortened esophagus or improper mobilization of the esophagus. The SAGES guidelines mention that mesh can be safely used in revi revisional surgery, but when the symptoms match the anatomical findings. What does this mean? I've had a couple of patients who are described to you as radiological recurrences. Where the X-ray and the CT done in a pre-employment checkup showed a small amount of fundus in the chest. However, patient had no symptoms or reflux. Please do not operate on these patients. Only when the symptomatology matches the radiology, then I would consider surgery. Now, this is what a correct fundo looks like, and this is what an incorrect fundo looks like, where you're suturing it on the entire wrap must be above the OG junction. So keeping an umbilical tape or a Foley catheter at the OG junction is mandatory and the wrap must be above this. Some common mistakes, and this is what is described in literature as type one to type three mis uh, mistakes of the wrap. I have seen almost all of them and I will show you some of the, the mistakes that I have seen in, uh, in various people's hands. This is a patient who came to me from a central Indian city of Nagpur who came with a pseudo achalasia. This was a patient developed severe dysphagia after a Nissen's fundoblication. You can see this is a tight wrap which has migrated and patient has what is called a pseudo achalasia. 
I took this patient back to theater, undid the wrap, brought the wrap down, mobilized the esophagus, and the patient has done well. But this is a picture exactly like an achalasia, except that the patient had no dysphagia pre-op, and this happened post-op. The second endoscopic picture is a acute wrap migration, and the same patient's barium is shown on the right-hand side. This is a surgical emergency. Do a CT scan, take them into OT straight away, and bring the wraps down. Remember, in very large defects, you may actually, when you dissect in the esophagus, you may have to dissect up to the inferior pulmonary vessels where you may rarely encounter the esophagus. But I have often opened the left or right pleura. To me, that's really not a big deal. I think now in 25 years, I, have, I think I've put four intercostal drains for these patients, and these are all patients who have recurrent hiatus hernia surgeries. Be very careful of this. Now, these are some of the patients that I'm going to show you had rap migrations or different kinds of complicated hiatal hernia surgeries. So this is a patient who came to us uh, post-op with a, a small bowel in the chest, which is migrated next to crura. Patient had intestinal obstruction. The one on the bottom left is a, is a, a rap migration, a paraesophageal hernia, and the bottom right is a sliding hiatus hernia with a rap migration. So please take care of these. These are formidable uh, surgical procedures. Please do it only if you have the experience of doing them. The second trick is please have an endoscope handy because I have had situations that after an hour of dissection, I have not been able to find the esophagus. We're doing an intra-op endoscopy and trans elimination, turning down the laparoscopic light may be of benefit. So these are various, you can see the amount of, the later you do it, the more the chance of mediastinal adhesions. In the immediate post-op period, like you see the top video, the bowel gets reduced down easily. Well, the bottom ones, you have patients who have developed mediastinal adhesions, and then reducing the wrap can be a surgical challenge. These are two of my earlier recurrent hiatus hernias. This is a patient who had an open nissen's fundoplication in a, a northern part of Mumbai called Thane. You can see the amount of adhesions between the stomach and the liver and the anterior abdominal wall, but you need to persevere I use generally sharp dissection for these patients, and you need to reduce the anatomy to virgin. Another technical trip is if you have difficulty in undoing the wrap, please just create a, a window, tunnel between the wrap and the esophagus and fire echelon to divide the fundus. If it, particularly those who come to you a little later with a lot of adhesions, may not be easy to do this. Again, some different kinds of wrap migrations and uh, recurrent hiatal hernia surgeries. I think just to emphasize that, you know, these are increasingly common problems. This is a patient I did an intra-op endoscopy. You can see the endoscope going down because I was not sure where the OG junction was. So these are the second rule is go for the right cruise first. Remember, a lot of these patients, you'll have difficulty finding. So go into the right cruise, then make your way anteriorly to find the left cruise, then do the mediastinal adhesions. And sometimes remember, you can also have adhesions to the lung. And I'll show you a video if you have time of adhesions of the lung and how this can be tackled. I think I'll keep my videos short. This is a patient where I just could not reduce the stomach down. I'm through the hiatus, seeing the lower lobe of the left lung, but the wrap is simply not coming down into the chest. This is a patient who would come to me from South Gujarat. The history was the patient had a stormy post-op course, had an intercostal drain placed after an essence fund application. You can see the amount of extensive uh, adhesions between the lung and the wrap. So clearly he must have had a, a, a wrap migration, which was ignored. I actually then have put in a scope in the left inter sixth intercostal space. And this is the thoracoscopic view. I'm using sharp dissection to take the wrap off the left lobe lung. The problem was this is a two lung anesthesia. So lung tends to ventilate, but this can be done with a little bit of patience. So this is, then I switched over back to the, to the abdomen and now I'm able to deliver the wrap down. This is one of the few patients where I show a shortened esophagus. And along with this, I had to do a gallus's gastroplasty, but I'll address this in the next 10 minutes. Just to emphasize that be prepared for this, look at the history carefully. Very rarely you'll have to do see this. This is a patient who came to us two, uh, two years after the fundoplication done elsewhere with dysphagia. Uh, endoscopy showed a piece of mesh in the esophagus. So this is a proline mesh that has eroded into the esophagus. This was sent to me by Dr. Dinesh Jain from Pune. And you can see the proline mesh has come in at the esophagogastric junction. So this is simply disaster. So never, never, ever put in a polypropylene mesh 
around the esophagus. That is a lesson you, uh, if you have to put in a composite mesh, I will tell you some of the tricks, how you can prevent rap, uh, mesh erosion, provided we have time at the end of this. I think it is almost uh, 40 minutes. I'll try and wrap up this. Pramod, is that okay? Five minutes more? You're, uh, put your right thumb up if you're okay with it. Yes, yes, yes. It's okay. okay. You can take about uh, 10 minutes also. Perfect. So the last part of my talk is the shortened esophagus. What is a short esophagus? To call it a short esophagus, after mobilizing the esophagus, you must be able to give, bring five centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus with tension or 2.5 centimeters without tension. That's the definition. And this is where I talk to you about type one and type two. Which patients are likely to have shortened esophagus? Those who have esophageal strictures, which are repeatedly dilated, those who have large parasophageal hernias, barrets, or those patients who have recurrent hiatal hernias. In these, the mediastinal fibrosis or recurrent dilatations may cause submucous fibrosis and the whole esophagus may be shortened. What is my strategy? You will do a type one, if necessary, then do a type two dissection and then reassess length. If I'm not able to get three centimeters after traction, then I will do colosis. Now, this is the classic colosis, but it's not possible. I have never been able to do this laparoscopically. So what I now do is a fundectomy. I will not show this because this is outside scope of this lecture, but just to put things in perspective, in the last 25 years, I have done four colosis gastroplasties by doing fundectomies. I'll actually excise a, a wedge of the fundus to create a neoesophagus, neo but remember the wrap must then be uh, wrapped around the new esophagus, not behind the stomach. I'm not going to play these videos. I think it's uh, getting on time. So is there really a need? So this is a paper that I, in 2003, in the annals of surgery, saying that with and without uh, colosis, the recurrence rates are equal. And like I said, I have in more than a thousand surgeries, I've had to do only four colosis. So this is a paper in innovations in surgery in 2013. Again, showing no difference in results between call. It's like mesh. There are people divided. Like uh, Dr. Demister is a great colossus fan. Any any problem, any concern, any recurrence, he would do a colossus. So I think there are like you have the two camps, like the Republican and the Democrats. Even in the U.S., you have the the gastroplasty fans and the non-gastroplasty fans. So this is this is extremely important. What is new in anti-reflux surgery? The links, the endostim and the endoflip. This is the links. I think I'm not going to go into many of these details. This is implanting magnetic beads around the CO junction. Still very little data, mainly being used for very small hiatus hernias or those patients who don't have hiatus hernias. So I'll, I'll uh, finish the lecture by giving some, some simple take home messages. Number one, let the patient earn the operation. There is a learning curve in this. Selectively do a 24 hour pH. But I believe in routine use of preoperative manometry. Quantitate esophageal length and crural defect. I've shown you our publication on this. Think about devising ways of preventing RAP migration. And please choose your RAP carefully based on the age, the body motility, and the symptom complex of this patient. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the AWR for giving me this opportunity. Yes, sir. You're there. Oh, yes, yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir, for uh, the wonderful talk on uh, uh, the intricacies in hiatus hernia management. I think we could have gone uh, quite a long further on different aspects of hiatus hernia management. Uh, so, as sir said, you can talk for an hour on uh, crural closure itself. I saw so Pramod maybe... uh, yawning twice, so I thought it's time to close. <laughs> no. <laughs> really? no. Just kidding, Pramod. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. And so maybe on in your talk. Yeah. Maybe we can have another talk on uh, management of paraesophageal hernias, large ones, which will have different uh, types of Thank management, you. considering you know the those things have not been covered here completely. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Pramod and Dr. Rahul. So it's about type of meshes, Prasad. I think. You know, the... Sorry. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I am quite excited about using the physics. I use the physics only twice. But the delayed absorbable meshes, I don't think we have data on this. But if you ask me surgical logic wise, perhaps the biologicals go very quickly. So they're not of any use. Composites have erosion issues. But maybe in the years to come, I'm looking for data to use the physics mesh at the hiatus. I'm, but I, I have open mind on this. Right, sir. So, uh, sir, Dr. Pramod. 
well roy it was a very crisp and detailed lecture talk at the same time i think you have addressed almost all the issues and really given messages at every step it was a lecture full of uh, what to do and what not to do so i'm sure the youngsters and the young surgeons and even seniors like me have enjoyed your talk and even i have learned a few things from this talk although i've listened to your talks so many times this was a new one i believe and uh, it was a great talk especially your change of paradigm from only nissens to uh, more of to pay less of nissens and even doors for a change thank you pramod so thank that you that shows how a surgeon should not be sticking to one procedure for his lifetime and has to be a thinking surgeon has to be a reading surgeon has to be aware of what is happening in the world and not only look at the literature what is happening outside his universe but also looking at his own experience and evolving that yes sir yes sir yeah i have a few questions but i'll ask them later yeah let rahul say something first yeah so rai sir it is uh, always uh, it's a pleasure to listen to you on this particular topic which is uh, really close to your heart and i know you for uh, doing this surgery and i'm following you doing this surgery since 2001 and i'm a great follower of uh, your hiatal hernia surgery and i have learned whatever i am doing today also is from you and you only and i I'm, i'm a great follower of you regarding a hiatal hernia surgery now there are uh, you are almost touch all the clinical aspects of uh, doing a laparoscopic uh, fundoplications and the types of fundoplications so when and where to do which type of fundoplication that is for sure you have mentioned almost all the critical points or critical views one should look at doing this laparoscopic hiatal hernia surgery that is for sure sir i want to have ask you two three questions first is regarding the uh, esophageal mobilization how much far one should mobilize in the mediastinum transhiatally that is my first question so uh, that should be some point where you should stop i i do understand that one should see for the length of the esophagus but anatomically if you see this structure you should not go beyond this so that should be a critical point i feel and what is the, your your uh, advice regarding this point so raul you need to get 5 cm inter abdominal length of esophagus period if i am not getting it i will continue dissecting i am used to doing transhiatal mobilization for esophagectomies so you you can safely go up to the inferior pulmonary vessels yeah. the only problem is sometimes in a paraesophageal hernia with very big defects on the right side you may hit the azygous vein so you must keep looking for that i you can land up injuring the either left or right pleura but that doesn't bother me too much yeah. i think uh, uh, you just get good peep to these patients and remember the old old timers the belsi mark 4 the left pleura was deliberately opened at that time in order to lengthen the esophagus yeah the the, ant, the posterior vagus was deliberately cut to lengthen the esophagus so as i said be a, a appreciate surgical history you there is a lot of learnings in that so i am very happy to go up to the inferior pulmonary vessels if i don't get 5 cm length of esophagus i will do a colosis so those are few and rare and few in between okay so regarding the uh, pleural opening do you feel that for closure of if someone is not getting the uh, pleura approximation while doing the pleuroplasty or while taking the uh, sutures on pleura one can do a deliberately open the pleura on both the sides let the gas go into the this thing to get the diaphragm or loosen the diaphragm or something like that that is what some of the american surgeons they advise that's why i am asking i don't agree with that you know even a 6 7 cm defect if you can under anesthesia you can always pull the pleura together but it's not a good idea because that pleural repair will break down Yeah. So just by opening pleura and you close the pleura under tension, this is invitation for pleural breakdown and rapid migration post-op. So generally, if I have a intercrural defect of more than six centimeters, I've said five. The 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 literature and Dr. Chobe's paper and Grandrat's paper in surgical endoscopy mentioned five centimeters. But my own criteria is six centimeters. If it's more than six centimeters, I have very high uh, incidence of putting a, a composite mesh there. 
and that to what i'll do is i'll close whatever crore is possible easily the remaining part i leave open but just take a loose darn as a bed for the mesh the mesh doesn't fold in so i don't think uh, you need to open plura to close the the crore i don't agree with that concept okay now another thing what as you rightly said one can you uh, use the uh, mesh for the uh, uh, you know uh, for to avoid the recurrence in case of the large defects and so so do you uh, again advise to put a falciform ligament in between the esophagus and the uh, mesh to avoid the uh, complications due to the like our own paper on this is currently in press it's been accepted in the journal of royal college of surgeons of edinburgh we have shown that using a live flap of falciform ligament which you take behind the esophagus between the mesh and the esophagus and suture it to the left crus we unfortunately we have only a five year follow up on these patients and the numbers are small but th this is a, a logical thing to do it's a biological flap i uh, with a hook take down the falciform ligament leaving it attached above the liver and take it between the mesh and the esophagus and suture it to the left crus the second thing i have sometimes done in very elderly patients with large paraesophageal hernias is to make a vertical release incision about 5 cm lateral to the left left crus divide it bring the left crus together and put a composite mesh lateral to the left crus so it's nowhere in it's about the spleen it doesn't come in contact with the esophagus until about 5 years ago i tried something called the release right crus release in this what was described by a group of american surgeons was you make a vertical incision on the right crus splitting the right crus in two parts now be careful because behind the right crus is the ivc, IVC. so you will do this carefully take the the split the right crus one part gets crew closure and then divide uh, then de uh, deploy a composite mesh over the right crus but i have now given that up i only put a do a release incision 5 uh, cm lateral to left crus uh, whenever i think uh, i don't want to put a mesh in contact with the esophagus but you know i have now deployed more than a i think 60 70 meshes and touch wood at least the patients have been come back to me maybe they have seen shivram or pramod with mesh erosion but so far i think this is something that is overstated i think i have yet to see a patient of mine come back i have seen two patients i showed you one picture of a proline mesh in the esophagus but that is surgical stupidity that i wouldn't call a mesh erosion but composite meshes can occur i think this risk is a little overstated as is the risk of colosis yeah now uh, regarding uh, another one question from my side now ki how many times you get your uh, for your post uh, for duplication patient the bloating symptoms and how to avoid bloating symptoms with the intraoperative techniques or trips to avoid the bloating in a post operative period so it was more of a problem in the early part of my career and as i said you are always there is a trade off between the efficacy and the problems so in a group of mild refluxes with borderline atypical symptoms for the last 2 years i have been doing dor and this does not cause bloat at all in 75% where i am doing a two pace i don't mobilize the the fundus extensively and there also the bloat is less i don't have strong data because it's very difficult to quantitate bloating but one th advice is divide the short gastric sparingly think about anti refund application though there is not a lot of data on this i think uh, dr watson from australia has recently got a publication in 2020 looking at anti refund applications with reasonably good uh, results so my mind is open about this so where do you uh, advise to start the uh, uh, to take a short gastrics from the uh, greater curvature of the stomach so, so i will only take the the top in the early part of my career until about 3 4 years ago i would start in the middle part of the body enter the lesser sac and uh, divide the whole vessels along the greater curve i no longer do that i do a lot of dissection from uh, from the left side of the patient and then only divide the last part near the fundus trying to devascularize as little as possible but yet you must have a good shoe shine and there should be no tension on your app having said that yeah yeah so for that you one should always look for the posterior adhesions of the around pancreas and the uh, posterior border of the stomach I'll also the around the uh, crust there also there are few uh, adhesions that one need to take off uh, while doing uh, while taking the wrap that is what i feel 
thank you sir thank you very much you are uh, really a gem of a person on this particular topic and you really give a very good advice always and it's a fantastic thing thank you so rahul there's a question that i'm seeing on the chat box from dr yeah. guru shantappa from hubli yeah. asking is it your opinion that polypropylene Poly mesh is contraindicated yeah uh, dr shivram do you want to take this question from the chat box uh dr roy i think already you have answered that yeah, polypropylene absolutely. mesh is correct absolutely not to be used i think if at all we have to use maybe maybe fasix or a composite mesh i think you have to patient selection better patient should ask for the surgery knowing in the benefits like for amputation absolutely i think uh, i also told you also emphasize that it's a symptoms driven surgery and patient should coming for asking for question your opinion on that dr roy absolutely true sir i think half the the battle is in the mind not just technical i fully take your point there are two more questions sir which i i would take one is does paraesophageal hernia need a mesh and yes i have a much higher incidence of putting mesh because paraesophageal hernias typically come in elderly patients and the defects are usually more than 6 cm this is from dr shikar pai the second question is from dr deepak patil who i think is from kolapur is a very well, good laparoscopic surgeon himself and he asked me what post op care do you take dr roy especially what feed and how many days i think i didn't tell you about this but our protocol is we will counsel our patients pre operatively that we usually discharge patients within 24 to 36 hours we don't put nasogastric tubes on table we don't put a foley catheter but we will ask the patient to remain on clear liquids for 48 hours and then thick liquids for another 5 days after that from day 8 to day 16 they are on soft blenderized food from day 16 to day 28 they are on chapatis and they start eating raw salad and alcohol only after 28 days and you must keep the patient in a propped up position for 24 hours post op tell your anesthetist to make sure he doesn't have retching vomiting as he comes out of anesthesia give the patient adequate anti emetics and ppis after surgery so this is a thing i didn't tell you but very very important which deepak has brought up roy i have one or two questions for you uh, one of the questions is uh, the regarding peptic strictures because some patients do come to us from the gastroenterologist or some come directly with peptic strictures so what is your policy of managing these patients with peptic strictures when you plan for a fundoplication that was my first question second question is barrett sisovix either a short or a long one uh, do you advocate endotherapy for barrett sisovix before hiatus hernia and what is your strategy for that red rag to the bull pramod Yeah. <laughs> I'll take the, <laughs> I'll take the second question first. Okay. I think uh, Barrett's esophagus first is not an indication for surgery. There is simply no data that anti-reflux surgery should be done for patients of Barrett's. What is important is remember in in the South Asian subcontinent, the progression. If you look at, I think this is one of the things that the Indian Society of Gastroenterology has done. It had a, a task force on GRD, and very clearly the Barrett's. in north america is different from the barrets that we see in south asia the progression between mild to moderate to severe dysplasia to carcinoma in c2 is much much lesser in our patients as compared to caucasian whites so in the us if you have a high grade this see remember there's no concept of carcinoma in c2 now so if you have a high grade dysplasia people in the us would still advise uh, surgery for them in india it's a no no barrets is not an indication for surgery and i don't advise them endotherapy i think uh, this is what i call tell my fellows is a ttp technique total time pass you know whether you do a radio, radio frequency ablation a emr a esd they still need long term follow up and very clearly i think these patients must remain on ppis and very close endoscopic surveillance we do chromo endoscopies in these patients and nbi regularly so we will do targeted jumbo biopsies up to 10 biopsies based on the nbi findings and the chromo endoscopy findings to look for dysplasia and believe me in the last 25 years i have never seen any of my patients progressing from mild to severe to malignancy but even barrets associated with hiatus hernias yes segment barrets i would go by the hiatus hernia and the symptoms i don't the barrets esophagus is not a factor in my indication for surgery I agree. If they have a hiatus which needs surgery, they will get surgery. Okay. If they have a Barrett's, I will document on paper and tell the patient, in spite of hiatus or near surgery, 
in spite of your reflux symptoms going away, you need to be on lifelong follow up till your Barrett's goes away. Very nice. And peptic stricture? Yeah, I have a short term memory. I've forgotten about that yeah. one. <laughs> So short term, uh, sorry, not short term, peptic strictures, I would, you know, uh, what I would do is I would first dilate them. We would do a, a Savary Gillard or a TTS balloon dilatation. First time around, keep them in high dose PPIs. If they get a recurrence, the second time around, I will do a 24 hour pH, a barium swallow in these patients and a monometry. And I would then do a, a four quadrant canacord injection of steroid into the stricture, just to make sure the stricture remains open. The disaster would be that I do a, 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 a two-pays in them and they form a, a submucous fibrosis and stricture again. And then everything is attributed to a complication of surgery. So mm. I would never operate on a patient until I know that endoscopically the stricture remains open mm. after a double-dose PPI or uh, addition of a, a H2 blocker to PPI or a endoscopic inje four quadrant injection of canacord. There is another question in the chat box. Uh regarding the usage of PPI post-operatively and how long do you use them? And uh, do you advise any specific uh, drugs for that? Again, a very good question from Guru, Dr. Guru Shantappa. I think, remember, when you do an anti-reflux surgery, you're, pre you're preventing further reflux. Most of my patients who come for this are volume refluxes with erosive esophagitis. So for these patients, giving them three to four weeks of high-dose PPI is mandatory because only then you will get adequate mucosal healing. So that point is well made, Dr. Guru Shantappa. Give PPIs for three weeks and then stop them after that. Hopefully, they should have no symptoms after that. He's also asking, you have any specific drug? Professor Guru Shantappa is asking. Uh, Dr. Shivaram, I don't think any one PPI is better than another. There are two things. When a person tells me he's PPI non-responsive, I will make sure that I look at compliance. I make sure that he's taking it 20 minutes before a meal. I will make sure that he's not taking antacid or a sucralfate with it. And sometimes I will switch a PPI before I call him PPI non-responsive. I told you early in my lecture that there's a difference between refractory symptoms and refractory GERD. And this is a very important. I think refractory GERD is a, is a, a one hour lecture by itself. And I think that's a group of patients that you must be very, very careful in advising surgery. So another question from my side, how do you manage the post-operative dysphagia after a surgery when the patient comes with uh, complaints of dysphagia? So when they come to you, if it's my own patient, then I know what I've done technically. I'm very sure that their window will be large, the pre-op manometry will be done and the body length will be okay. I will just, I am pretty certain that it will be only edema. I'll counsel them and I hardly, with this post-op protocol of liquids, blenderized diet, Prasad, to be honest, in the last several years, I have not seen dysphagia. If you do see dysphagia from another center coming in, the first thing you look at is, is the pre-op monometry showing a normotensive LES? Because in which case the surgery was not indicated. Number two, was the body motility normal or was it ineffective? In an ineffective motility, if you've done a nuisance, you've got a problem. Number three, is there any evidence of collagen vascular disorder? Is there a rash? Is there a history suggestive scleroderma? I believe in, in some of these patients do a scleroderma profile. If it's a borderline, see, remember when you say that absent body motility, I think motility is a is a process of evolution. Mm -hmm. You don't have always patients with scleroderma with absent motility. You will have seven or eight or nine wet swallows out of 10, which are failing, but one swallow does go down. So it's it's a process of evolution. So if I see something in the pre-op monometry, I know that probably this, and you, in, if you have done a, a fundoplication for a collagen vascular disorder, the only thing that's going to help is taking down the fundoplication. And I've done it about three or four times in my career. The second is those patients who have technical problems. So like I showed you that barium of a pseudo achalasia prasad. Yeah. So that patient is not going to get well. Yeah. You have two choices. Either just do a balloon dilatation or a Savary Gillard, but that's an uncontrolled thing and the patient's going to get reflux because of it. So I would prefer to go into the abdomen again, undo the cruel closure, which is the cause of this, or undo the improperly done wrap, do a loose cruel closure or a forward is catheter, and then do a two pace. This is the way I would approach that. Thank you. Dr. Brijesh, any questions? Uh, Dr. Roy, see, there are a lot of surgeons in the periphery who are operating. They may not have the manometry facility. Yeah. So any advice for them from you? Or they should not operate at all? I wouldn't say that. I think if you ask me on a scientific pro, uh, platform, I would say, please do a manometry for all patients. From a practical point of view, 
I would say that if you're in a peripheral hospital, you have the technical ability to do a fund application, then look at your patients carefully. Like I told you, I separate my patients in two groups, the volume refluxes who get liquid or food coming in the mouth and the patients with heartburn or the acid refluxes who only get burning behind the chest. Be careful of these patients. If you have a patient with heartburn, I will never suggest you do a fund application without a manometry. But if you have a volume refluxer who is PPI responsive and who has no dysphagia and no atypical symptoms, I can tell you a lot of my fellows in periphery are doing a 2 pairs. So again, without a manometry, never nissens. Always 2 pairs, And you will be okay. So this is from a practical, non-scientific point of view with no evidence to back me. I think that's a very good advice. Roy. Yes, Pramod. How about the laryngopharyngeal reflux patients uh, coming with uh, throat and uh, respiratory symptoms and ENT surgeons and chest physicians sending to us for GERD? They don't have a hiatus hernia. So LPR is one of the areas that I have an interest in. We are now doing cricopharyngeal monometry as well as 24-hour pH in these patients. See, the typical, <clears throat> they, get, <clears throat> they keep doing this irritation in the back of the throat. Sure. And that's one of the commonest things. They have loss of timber or voice. These are, these are atypical symptoms of GERD. So the first thing in these patients are, are they PPI responsive? They obviously come to you from ENT surgeons, so there is nothing in the... So they get this granular pharyngitis. That's a common cause of reflux. They may not have normal IDL. They have a normal IDL, but granular pharyngitis. Mm -hmm. But they'll usually come to you having taken about 23 courses of antibiotics and steroids and uh, levocetrazine and what have you. So the first question I ask myself is, are we missing some ENT problem? Number two, is he PPI responsive? If he is, then I would do an endoscopy. I would do a 24-hour pH. And I would very, very, very selectively offer surgery. I must have done surgery about seven times so far for LPR. So these are atypical symptoms. I am actually, this is one of the groups I have interest with. Patients who come only with non-cardiac chest pain, who have normal uh, monometry, but strongly uh, Demister score more than 14. What do you do for these patients? So, but let's go for another lecture another day not for a, the general lecture today. Yeah. And these are the patients who would need careful documentation of all tests, no shortcuts. Extremely, extremely careful uh, evaluation. But the general message we should give a youngster is do not operate a patient with atypical symptoms. Number two, do not operate a patient who is PPI non-responsive. The Shivrams and Pramod Shindes and Rahul Madhavs of the world can uh, do evaluation and do them. It's not for everyone. Dr. Rahul, we can wrap up. Yeah. I think, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Rajesh, you have yes, any questions? No, sir, exactly. Sir, I had just answered. I was going to ask for other young Turks of our group. Yeah. When we are planning to operate and we get a manometry done or a pH monitoring done, what exactly they should look for when they are thinking of doing it or what they should look for where, where they have to avoid doing the procedure. Okay, then. I think uh, You're there. The all aspects have been covered already and uh, yeah. any, more, any more questions remaining from anyone, uh, sir? Uh, well, Madhar, sir? I just have one comment. Roy, I think you should change your uh, analogy of having uh, Having got the, uh, white hairs, you know, <laughs> that doesn't suit you because we can't see not even one tiny black, uh, white, gray hair. Actually. That, that's the ad advantage of this light promo that I've chosen. I made sure it's so bright that nothing is seen. Every we time you see my ball patches. Having acquired some gray hair, then we can't see that. We, I mean, <laughs> I don't have any hair, so I can't even say that I have gray hair. So. <laughs> Thank you. You'll have to find some other uh, phrase for that. <laughs> thank you so, so thank you very much for this excellent talk and uh, it was extremely informative all aspects related to hiatus hernia have been covered especially aspects related to young surgeons starting to operate hiatal hernias and where should they should actually undertake a surgery and when not to operate which is the most important thing and when you do operate you actually said that if manometry is not possible, go for a toupee and not a nuisance uh, fundoply cushion, which might lead over dysphagia. And I think, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, any new young surgeon who's going to start doing hiatus hernia should go to a center like Dr. Roy's center 
and stay there maybe for a week and see a few surgeries how how they do the protocol the patient positioning the antibiotic uh, i mean prophylaxis and all that so that they are good when they go back and they start doing hiatus hernia surgeries so thank you very much sir thank you everyone uh, dr rahul dr pramod uh, dr shivram and uh, dr brijesh thank you thank you everyone for attending thank you. and uh, thank you. we thank look you. forward to the next one thank, thank you roy sir thank you and thank pleasure you, to be with you thank you awr surgeons yes. thank you bye bye